All right. Um, if you guys have your Bibles, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 4, uh, continuing in our series through Genesis. So Genesis chapter 3 um, was two weeks ago, and that was uh, sin entering the picture. So that was Adam and Eve, uh, their first sin. I'm actually going to be um, preaching on that tomorrow. Just I've been ever since going through that with you guys have just been kind of camping out there and, and marinating on that. So I'm going to be doing that and then this chapter the following week. But let's take a look. So Adam and Eve um, have sin. They have consequences. They've been kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And, uh, and so now this is the continuation of, of their life. So uh, verse 1, we're going to read verses 1 and 2 really quick. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain, a worker of the ground. So uh, post Eden, we're going to get a glimpse at life being lived that is not really alive. So man is dead. He has an unnatural separation from God. When, uh, when man and woman sinned, they were now separated from God. And so they, um, when they looked and viewed that word death, Moses, is, he's the one that penned these words. His readers viewed death as an unnatural separation from the, the body, from the soul. And so they would have understand or understood that when when God said in that day you will surely die and yet they didn't die that day the readers understood that to mean okay there was some kind of unnatural separation and that unnatural separation was between man and God now so there was this unnatural separation because we were meant to be in this union with God and so now there was separation so there instead of that natural connection with God. Now there's a substitute connection with God, uh, and it's not the one that was intended. Uh, Eve clearly is giving credit and glory to God for being able to have a child. She, you know, she's praising the Lord for being able to have these kids. What's interesting is in, we're, we don't necessarily know, but we're not really given, sorry, that's my phone. Um, we're not really given ages at this point. We don't know how old Adam and Eve were when they gave birth to Cain and Abel. Because of, if you were here for the first couple chapters of Genesis and the creation account, we talked about the separation of the waters from the waters so that there was ocean water, but there was also a layer of water, atmosphere, that was kind of protecting them from the sun and allowing people to live much, much longer than what we do now. So uh, it's highly possible that they could have lived 100 years or 200 years before having kids. We don't know that. It's a speculation. That's just Ron Foster commentary. All right. So don't go to the bank with that. But um, there's a possibility of that. So and then it lists Cain and Abel's occupations. They're clearly fulfilling the mandate on mankind, which was to keep the land and to rule over the animals. So you see one of them is keeping the land. He's a farmer and one is ruling over the animals. He's a a shepherd. So uh, verse three, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. So uh, his face didn't literally fall off. That's not what that means. In case you were wondering, (laughs) that'd be incredible. Uh, There are a lot of speculations as to why Abel's offering was accepted and Cain's offering was not. Here's here's a couple reasons why. Uh, One, that Abel offered a blood offering and Cain did not and that it was understood that this was the type of offering he was supposed to offer up. So that's that's one of the argued reasons why uh, why maybe God accepted Abel's but not Cain's. It was established with 
um, Adam and Eve, that there was a sacrifice for their sin, and that was a sheep offering or a sheep sacrifice. Um, one of the arguments against that would be that uh, in Leviticus, we're given acceptable sacrifices and offerings, and vegetables and fruit are part of that. So I'm not fully convinced that was probably the reason. Number two, another reason that it could have been that Abel offered up his best. It says that he offered up the firstborn and the fat portions. So making that sacrifice. So it makes a distinction of what Abel is offering. It's saying he's offering his best to God, whereas um, Cain's offering, it says some fruit of the ground. So like it doesn't say Cain offered his best of his fruit or vegetables or whatever it is that he was growing. It just says, oh, here's some fruit. Here you go, God, here's some fruit. And, and so, um, so some people think possibly it was because it wasn't his best versus Abel's best. Um, the third one, third reason that this, this has more to do with the intent and the heart of the individual making the offering the one that's offering up the offering. So this implied that Abel's heart was good and that he had a glad heart to offer up to the Lord because he loved the Lord. It also implies that Cain had a bitter heart that he really didn't want to offer up anything to the Lord at all because God knows the hearts. He knew to accept Abel's offering and not Cain's regardless of what they were offering. So it didn't necessarily have to do with the what they were offering. It had to do with their attitude in the offering. Um, I personally, pro I lean probably towards that last reasoning and, and I'll kind of talk about which one. There's cases to be made with each one. It could be a combination. Um, but regardless, the outcome was that God's not accepting Cain's checking the box was not accepted and, and it angered Cain even more. He knew he couldn't get away with just going through the motions. So, so if Cain's heart was bitter or bad and didn't want to offer up anything in the first place, now he's kind of like, all right, well, Abel offered something. Here's some, I'll put a fruit basket together for God and here you go. And God knew that his heart wasn't there. He knew his heart wasn't right. In the New Testament, we see something similar when talking about taking communion and some instructions Paul gave was if you have something against your brother, uh, when it comes time to bring your offering, leave your offering there at the altar, go and make your, you know, your dispute right first, then come back and offer up, implying that if you have sin in your heart, if you're regarding sin, if you have a sin against your brother, that you need to make right. You need to do that before offering up anything to God because God loves obedience over sacrifice. Um, so Cain is clearly upset now, uh, so much so that it, his, it says his face fell. I, I kind of think of that phrase, it's kind of more like just like, oh, you know, when you, when you just you can't do anything right. And it's just like you just your, your shoulders drop, just, oh man, you know, like that kind of deal. But I, I have a feeling it's more than just that because it's, it's probably that because he was just trying to get away with it. He was trying to get the box checked without really having to offer up anything to the Lord, without loving God. And so now he's like, man, can I just get this over with and be done with this? So then God comes and he speaks to Cain in verse six. He says, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. So God comes and he speaks and has a conversation with Cain. And this is why I kind of lean towards that third, um, uh, third idea of why his offering wasn't accepted because he was regarding sin in his heart because of this conversation, because God is saying, if you do well, he's not talking about the offering here. He's not saying if you bring me a blood sacrifice, he's not saying if you go and get the other fruit, Cain, you know, like he's saying you need to do well in life. You need to get 
your sin right. If you do well, you're, you'll, you will be accepted. And if you do not do well, sin is ready to pounce on you. And we learned from the last chapter that the union with sin is death, which is an unnatural sap- separation, separation, uh, unnatural separation with God. And so that's implying even not only with God, but with other people. And we're going to see. So, so uh, just some things about this six and seven. It's pretty amazing that God would have this intimate conversation with Cain, despite Cain's attitude. Cain clearly doesn't want to even offer up the fruit that he did offer up, and yet God still comes to him and tries to reason with him. Cain, let's work this out. Just make the right choice. Uh, So God offers Cain an opportunity to repent, to change direction, and this is, you know, that's why I think his offering wasn't accepted, because he was doing wrong, not just with the offering, but with his life. So in other words, Cain, choose me over yourself and you'll get this right. If, if you'll choose to follow me over following yourself, it, you're going to be good. Realize that you are still dependent on me and you'll get this. Cain was trying to live independent of God and that was that was what was causing this suffering in his life. So in other words, if you don't choose me, it's going to destroy you. You can try and not choose me. You can try and not depend on me, but that choice is going to hurt you. Sin is crouching at your door and that's going to destroy you, Cain. So choose me and you're going to be good. Look at what your parents did. Learn from them. Choose me. Be dependent on me. Otherwise, that sin is going to destroy you. So let's see, did Cain listen? Verse 8, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Now, I don't, it doesn't tell us what that conversation was. Maybe he was questioning Abel about his allegiance to God. Maybe he was questioning about that. Maybe he was venting about, man, God came to me, told me I have to get get my life right. What do you think? I think I'm living an okay life. What do you think? And probably Abel's like, well, you, are, yeah, you know, you need to follow God. You have been sinning, you sinner. You know, like, I don't know. Uh, it, it could have been anything, you know, younger brothers do that to older brothers. So um, it could have been anything along those lines. But regardless, whatever it is, they were out in the field. Cain kills his brother. Uh, so this shows Cain's downward spiral towards sin and rebellion against God. He was angry at God, not Abel. But Cain couldn't kill God. So what does he do? He takes it out on the obeying brother. Notice that this is similar to Satan's motive. I can't defeat God, so I'll do what I can against his creation. I'll do what I can against those that are created in his image. I can't beat him, so I'll I'll beat the thing that he loves. That's Satan's motive. He, he hates uh, humans. So uh, Cain now seems like he's taking on that same motive. I can't beat God. I'm going to take out the one that God has accepted, Abel. This could also be a slap in the face at God as if to say, oh, you want a blood offering, do you? Here you go. Here's Abel. So there, that could be an uh, argument for the blood offering reason. Verse 9. The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? As if he didn't know. Abel said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? So now Cain is talking with some sarcasm towards God. Like he's got an attitude now. Um, So again, similar moment to Adam and Eve in the garden. Where are you? God asked the question, where are you? But he's not asking Abel because he knows where Abel's at. So Cain, where, where is he? Uh, why did he come to Cain? Because he already knew what happened. He's God. He's giving Cain an opportunity to confess what's happened. So again, we see Cain's anger being expressed back at God in his sarcastic response. So not only is he trying to hide or deny what he had done, but he's blatantly and openly defiant against God here. Can you imagine, like, some of you guys maybe grew up in homes with maybe some, some strictness. I, knew, I know I did. Not super strict, but I know that if I talked back to my dad 
the way Cain spoke to God here. Like if my dad came and said, hey, where's your older brother, Scott? I don't know. What am I, my brother's keeper? That would not go well for me in our household. And some of you guys can relate to that. Um, so I can only imagine what was Cain thinking here, you know? So um, verse 10, then the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. So that kind of gives an implication that maybe he buried him. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. So it's kind of gruesome, uh, kind of gruesome wording there. <laughs> like the ground is opened to receive your brother's blood. Um, God clearly wants Cain to confess. He's even saying, he's, where's your brother? No answer. What have you done? And he's still not going to answer. You know, there's been many times as a parent that I already knew what one of my kids has done, but I was hoping they would choose honesty. You know, I already know what you did. I want to give you an opportunity to tell me what you've done. So sometimes, you know, and maybe you guys have been set up by your parents with that. Like, is there anything else that you feel the need to tell me right now? Now's your last chance. And you start thinking, do they know? They can't know. Do they know? They can't know. Mm -hmm. And so you don't take that opportunity and then they come out with it and they knew and you're busted. Um, and, and that's what happens with me as a parent. I give them a chance. Uh, is there anything else you want to tell me? I, I, I've even done that with adults where we've had to confront people over, over sin and I knew what they had done. And so I, I, I remember sitting in a back office here and I, and, and I felt like a lawyer, like Perry Mason or something, you know, like, is there anything you want to tell me? Anything else? And, um, and I had like printouts of stuff that they had been doing like under the desk. No, no, nothing. Can you explain that? You know, you slam it on the ground and I'll have to tell you that story later. Um, not on film. Uh, so, but that's what God is, is, is doing here. You know, Cain's punishment is going to be a reflection of himself. He's a farmer. His punishment is going to be upon him and his work. He's talking about already God started laying the ground. He said, you are cursed from the ground. So verse 12, he says, when you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and wanderer on the earth. So Cain has been living his life being a farmer and producing fruit. Now, if you remember last chapter, the ground is already cursed because of man's sin. Cain has figured out how to make the ground produce, even with the ground being cursed. So Cain is a good farmer. He understands what it takes to get the stuff from the ground. He doesn't kill the plant in three days. Um, you know, he knows, he knows what to do to get it. And now God is saying it will no longer yield anything for you. Your occupation is done. You're just going to wander this earth. The work that you've prided yourself in will no longer work for you. You're going to be a drifter. You're going to be wandering for the rest of your life. And then verse 13, you finally, once the punishment is coming down, you finally get to hear some, some words of like, gosh, I wish I God, that's a harsh punishment. You know, he says, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you've driven me today away from the ground and from your face. I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. The first thing to, to look at in there, and I think this is the biggest part from your face I shall be hidden. That's the part that Cain understands is a big deal. Just as in that unnatural separation of God to man when Adam and Eve committed their sin, Cain had a substitute relationship with God. It wasn't this walking in the garden type of relationship that his parents had, but clearly there was communication with God. It wasn't the ideal, but there was some communication. And now 
he knows that there's even an even bigger separation in his relationship with God as a result of this. My, my face will be hidden from your face. There's going to be an unnatural separation, a death occurring here. Then he gets to the practical. He gets to the, the earthly. I will be a fugitive and wander on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. So Cain understood the magnitude of the, of the punishment. It went way beyond the work he was used to doing with the vegetables and the fruit. He understands that he's being cast even further than Eden now. So they, they probably weren't living too far away from the Garden of Eden at this time. And now he's saying, you got to move. You're just going to wander further. Uh, and, and he said, you know, people are going to know why I'm wandering. They're going to know of the awful deed that I've done. And they're going to want justice for Abel's life. He said, they're, when they find me, they're going to kill me. So then the Lord said, verse 15, then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So God, for some reason, still shows compassion on Cain, even in the midst of his punishment, and he provides an unknown mark. Uh, no scholars know what this mark was. No one has any thought, any idea what this mark looked like or what it could have been, um, but that it would be a marker to anyone that, that saw him. So, and it was an identification that he was not to be touched. Um, just an interesting thought, like if you're just thinking about, okay, you had Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, who were all these people that he's talking about are going to find him? You know what I'm saying? Like, what do you mean if anyone finds me? There's only two people left according to what we know. It's highly possible because of how long they lived uh, back then. You know, you had people pre-flood living for six, seven, eight, some 900 years. So it's highly possible that they're in year three or 400 and they've already had generations upon generations upon generations upon generations of children. So people could have been already scattering and all that Moses was focusing on writing here of what God gave him was the story of the first two sons of Adam and Eve. Otherwise, why else is Cain talking about all of these other people? Clearly, there were many other people on the earth at that time. Um, it also says that he settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Um, that land called Nod has never been identified on a map. We don't know where it's at. It clearly went away uh, with the flood. Then it gets into Cain's um, life. It says Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. <laughs> um, to Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mehujael, and Mehujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech, and Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Adah, and the name of the other, Zillah. Adah bore Jabel. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. That's not like telling lies. It's an instrument. Zillah also bore Tubal Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. So a lot of names in there, a lot of, a lot of genealogy. But we do get some interesting things about this early generation. It's just a fascinating part of life back then to think about. Um, still, uh, few people on earth. Cain's wife is likely one of his, well, I mean, it is, it's going to be one of his relatives. Let's just face it. Uh, uh, we don't know how close could, it could be as close as a sister, could be as far as a third or fourth cousin, you know, so we, we're just, we don't know. Um, uh, we don't know how, again, we don't know how old everyone is when they're getting married. Um, you could potentially, you know, I talked about the generational stuff, could potentially see 25 to 30 generations 
as you're living that long on the earth. So in the middle of all this, though, it mentions this guy Lamech in verse um, 18 and then going into 19. And it pauses and it tells you something about this guy. And it's, and, you know, he's about to have a side story, but it starts here with Lamech, a descendant of Cain, defying God and doing what he wants to do by marrying two women. God gave the ordinance of marriage with Adam and Eve, and he never said anything about multiple. So you have this guy, and he's the first one um, defying that. And then it gets into Lamech a little bit more in verse 23. Lamech said to his wives, Adah and Zillah, hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Like, who talks like that? That's funny. Uh, Listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. So you have this quick little pause of this guy Lamech, and I think it's for a reason, but uh, so Lamech callously is bragging about killing a man for wounding him. So like he calls him a young man, punches him. It says, strikes me. He struck me, so I killed him. And he's telling his wives, about it. Then he jokes about Cain and himself describing the outcome for Cain and how his offense is and should be much worse. So he's like, hey man, if Cain, if Cain's revenge was sevenfold, my revenge on me, if someone comes after me, should be 77 times whatever Cain had coming on him. Like this guy's an idiot and he's bragging about killing someone. And it, it, and it leaves that side story with that. But I think that's just a description. It's just letting us know how uh, spiraling sin is already becoming with the people of earth. Started with Adam and Eve, got worse with Cain and Abel, and now one of Cain's descendants is already in this spot where he's bragging about killing about killing someone. And I think that's just, that's just for our knowledge Why was this put in the Bible? It's so that we know that there's always a downward spiral with sin. It closes the chapter in 25, 26 back to Adam. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. So Seth also a son, oh, sorry, to Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So um, this, 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 why close it out with this? They clearly had other sons and daughters. We don't know all of their names, but this lets us know with both sons basically gone because Abel's dead and Cain has been kicked out. He's wandering the earth now. God provides a way for Adam's line to continue and it not go through Cain. The people also were realizing that they needed God. I would love just the end there. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. So the people were realizing we still need God. Cain tried to live his life independent of God. We realized that was wrong. So what did they do about it? They started calling on the name of the Lord. That's why we call on him, because we know we need him. They didn't have that intimate relationship that they were meant to have with him anymore, but they were able to still have a relationship. It was a substitute relationship of what was meant to be in the garden, but they did call on the name of the Lord. So four four basic truths that we can take away from, from this. Number one there, sin and rebellion start small and internally. Cain clearly was thinking about wanting to live his own life. It started just with his thoughts, and then it continued with wanting to do his way and not God's way. And and it starts small, and it starts internally. But eventually, number two, eventually what is in the heart comes out. It starts internally, but if you keep festering on those internal thoughts 
If you give way to them, you know, God said to Cain, sin is crouching at your door. It's going to take over your life. And, and, and eventually what's inside comes out. And that's what ended up happening. What was inside Cain's heart came and God gave him that speech first. Then he killed Abel. Number three, God always provides a way back to him. God gave, I need to get out of the sun is what I need to get out of. There we go. We'll do, sorry. Um, God provided a way to Cain. He said, if you do well, you're going to do, you're going to be accepted. But if you don't, it's going to go badly for you. God always provides a way. And we know that from the New Testament as well. First Corinthians 10, 13. It's one of the verses that I've memorized in life. And it talks about that God will make a way of escape. When, when temptation comes, God always provides a way of escape. I remember that verse because of uh, a guy in my life from New York. He was an NYPD SWAT. They don't ha technically have SWAT. They call it emergency services and rescue. So there's no New York SWAT in case you didn't know that. Um, but that he, they basically did what a SWAT team does. And he was a member of that team. He was the guy that if you ever watch like police officer shows and they're like um, exercising warrants, there's always a guy with like a big, huge thing knocking the door down. And right behind that guy is a guy with a shield. You know what I'm talking about? And he goes in first. He was either sometimes the guy that knocked down the, the door down or he was the guy with the shield. That guy one year was um, giving a talk in our vacation Bible school and he had a tattoo that said 1013 on it because of this verse. But he said it, it also is a re helpful reminder of this verse because um, police officers have codes for everything. And the code 1013 for police is officer needs assistance. And it has so much to do with that verse of, God, I need assistance. <laughs> you know, he's always going to provide a way of escape. And God provided Cain the way of escape. He came to him before he executed his sin. He said, Cain, don't do it. Just come, repent, follow me. And he didn't take it. And then number four, sin has a bigger impact than just ourselves. Sin has a bigger, we, when we're, Thinking about when we're being tempted with sin, we're only thinking about ourselves and how it affects us. But sin impacts everyone around us. And this story is an example of that in that Cain sinned against his. So it affected his brother, but also it affected all of his descendants all the way down to this guy, Lamech. That's a result of Cain's decision. And it kept spiraling downward. Do you think Cain started teaching his family to follow God after all of this occurred and he's wandering the earth? No. And it affected so many other people other than just himself. The hope, though, is that when sin is crouching at the door, when we're being tempted with sin, God will always provide a way of escape. And God is providing those ways for us on a daily basis. And I can tell you every single time that I have failed, every single time that I know that I've, uh, I've sinned against God, I've sinned against someone else, every single time I can go back and think about that the Holy Spirit was prompting me before I took that. It was a choice. Nothing was forced on me. Everything I've ever done was a choice. And every single time the Holy Spirit was saying, you know, you could just walk out right now. You could just go. Um, that's probably the best thing to do right now. Every single time God was providing a way of escape for me. Sometimes I take that way and sometimes I blow it. And God still, even when Cain blew it, he still provided grace for him. Even in his sin, God will provide grace, but he also requires repentance. And so that's where we're going to stop with this chapter. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Lord, uh, just to fathom and, and imagine this scene, this scenario of a brother killing his, his own brother because he's mad at you. Because he didn't want to follow you, because he wanted to do his own thing. Lord, I pray uh, that we would 
not be falling into those traps. I pray that we would have a desire to follow you. Help us know that that sin starts small. It's never just outright in our face. That's not Satan's tactic. He knows that we might, we might resist that if it was just blatant in our face, but if he can start small and get us thinking internally, he has his foothold and sin is crouching at the door. Lord, I pray that just as we learned with the Armor of God series, that we would be well armed against those temptations, against sin. And Lord, we'll give you all the praise and the glory for it all. In your name I pray. Amen.